are a blended family. We 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 are a blended family. And we are a blended family. Hi, we're Doctors Larry and Carol Snap. We're glad to have you with us today. Blended families, week six of twelve, vertical versus horizontal relationships. Uh, again, I, as usual, I'd like to just give a shout out to ChristianLivingRadio.com. They take our audio from the classes and then put it out on their internet web radio station. Uh, Usually about once a month they come in and do a live broadcast from here. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, so we're going to be talking about the differences between the vertical and the horizontal relationships. This is probably one of the more important chapters, lessons out of the 12. Uh, obviously we start off with basic marriage stuff because it's this is a marriage ministry but it's also a Christian marriage ministry so we have to kind of get deeper into the vertical and especially the vertical but then how that impacts the horizontal relationships that we have um, if we if you go to first John 1 and go through verses 3 through 10, I'm not going to read the whole thing right now, but if if you look at verses 3, 7, and 9, it really kind of lays out how to have a good vertical relationship. So it's talking about, you know, having that relationship with God, putting Him first in your life, and those kind of things. But then it also says in verses 6, 8, and 10, what happens when there is sin in your life. It not only blocks the vertical relationship with with God, but it's going to mess up all the other relationships you have with on the horizontal with humans, right? Spouses, children, other family members, and so forth. Everybody else that's listed in the pyramid. <laughs> okay, so that's where I like to start. It, it kind of lays out kind of the differences between the vertical and then it says how sin blocks the vertical and if the vertical is out of alignment then the horizontal one relationships will have problems so that's always a good place to start so just in case vertical means up and down Everybody should know that, but you never know. Wow. So, okay. Again, you know, there might be a language barrier. What happened a little bit earlier? Well, that's true. So that's good that you're trying to do that. <laughs> uh, that was a matter of <laughs> So, right. So, vertical means up and down, north and south. Okay, that represents our relationship with God. In other words, our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so how how does a vertical relationship work? I mean, we're talking about an invisible entity. You know, it's a spirit. It, it's not like a flesh and blood human being that we see walking around. Some people had the honor and privilege of seeing him walking around on the planet, but that was 2,000 years ago. Okay, so <clears throat> Hebrews 10.38 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So that vertical relationship is going to be based on faith. And basically what it says is without faith, it's going to be impossible to please God. So we have to go on trust that what is in the Scriptures is true. It's, it is the Word of God. And, and that's why it's based on faith. We have to believe 
that what was written 2,000 years ago and before is actually the Word of God. And it's, you know, especially in today's culture, most people, well, you know, I can't see it, so it's not real. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge to convince someone that, you know, God is real because we're just human beings doing human stuff for the most part. But there are signs and wonders. If you look for them, you will find them. I know it's hard for us to equate. I mean, I'm not trying to um, diminish our, our relationship with God, but there are things that we know that we can't see. For instance, love. You know, I'm oh, right. a great example also about the Spirit. He said, you don't know where the, the wind is coming and going, but we we feel that when it comes. Yeah. So it's kind of... Yeah, we we don't really see the wind, but we see the effects exactly. of the wind. Yes. So, yeah, good point. Um, and one of the other things, when we're talking about faith, and the next thing is it's believing things you can't see. Right? Now, let's see, 10, no, 11, 1 and 11, 3. It's like faith is the sub- substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And then 11.3 is, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, to me, the easiest example of that is, just say, a, a wooden table. Okay, we see the table, but it's made up of atoms that create wood and cells and plants and fibers and all this stuff. But when you get way down on the microscopic level, it, it takes that kind of vision to be able to see what's really, really there. So we, we see the product of the microscopic in a wooden table. So we don't see the atoms, but we see what the atoms built, right? So that's that was the easiest thing for me to kind of wrap my head around is everything's made up of molecules and atoms and all this stuff on that extremely microscopic level, and we can't see those with our eyes. Mm-hmm. But when you put enough of them together, then we can start seeing stuff. So the vertical is based on faith. Faith is believing things you can't see. And then the reason we have a vertical is because we're sinners. We either go to hell or we go to heaven. The default is hell. (laughs) You know, we're born into the default, which is the bloodline of Adam. And we need to get into the bloodline of Christ somewhere somewhere along the line. So in order to do that, we have to have faith that Christ is who He said He was. right? But we're saved by God's grace. He didn't have to. Grace is one of those things that we can't earn it. It's a free gift. And you have to be humble enough to just accept it. Humans being prideful <laughs> want to do something. They can say, okay, well, I did this, so then I, I earned the grace. right? <clears throat> but we are saved by grace alone, not through anything we've done. Through faith alone. So we have, it's only by God's grace and through our faith in Him and by Christ alone. So the only way to be saved is because God set it up by His grace through our faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And one of my favorite scriptures, it was on the cover of my Bible, John fourteen six. Jesus in the red letters <laughs> said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. 
So in that one scripture right there, it eliminates any other way to get to heaven. Everybody wants to have their own way. You know, everybody says, oh, well, you know, God's a good God. He loves everybody, so everybody's going to go to heaven. Well, that's not what that says. Amen. So, so what does salvation do for us? Right? Well, James 20, 2.20 and 2.26 makes reference to the fact that we are not saved by our good works, but for good works. Amen. And faith without works is dead. It's nothing. I mean, people can, I mean, you hear it all the time. People say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, show me. Show me the money. Right? People, it's like, well, I'm an American. So, yeah, I'm a Christian. So, I'm a Christian. That means I go to heaven, right? Well, not necessarily. <laughs> well, that was even true with my mother. When she was dying. Oh, yeah. You asked her. You know, at one, if you were to die, where, where would you go? Would you go to heaven? She says, well, yeah. Well, how do you know you'd go to heaven? Well, because I've done things for people. I've done good things for people. And then I piped up and said, yes, you have. And you didn't. Uh, you were always complaining you did for the people. <laughs> That's not doing good works. Well, it's a hard thing. Right? Yeah, I, we're pretty sure we got her into the pearly gates at the last second. The whole family go fighting for her. Yeah, it was that was a rough week. <laughs> when she ended up in the hospital, there was some really heavy spiritual warfare going on there. Yeah. But pretty sure she made it. Okay, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone. And we are not saved by good works, but for good works. Right? You have to, partly out of the gratitude of being saved, you should want to do good things. Right? I mean, that's the whole point. You know, it's not just, whew, I got to get out of hell free card. And then you just live your own life, and never do anything for anybody. You know, fire insurance. Fire insurance, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> fire policy. You know. I I heard somebody say yesterday that Christianity is about depopulating hell and populating heaven. Yeah, that's good. I've never heard it that way before, but that's good. Um, so you know. Once you become saved, then you become part of the body of Christ, which means we gather together as a body, which is the church, right? The church is really supposed to be, as a corporate entity, the people in the church, in the building, should be getting out of the building and going out into the community to do the good works. Right? Uh, we were talking about unity in the community, Yesterday, from a marriage perspective, right? Unity begins in the marriage, creates unity in the family. The families that are in unity build unity in the church, and then the church can impact the community, right? So we wanted to make sure that the people realized that it's it's been around a long time but a lot of churches start out as the hospital for the sinners and after some time it becomes the hotel for the saints <laughs> it's you know the majority of the people are now saved and they don't want to deal with the sinners anymore they were one, and they were glad to be in, invited in. Not, oh, we don't want them in here. So they upgraded the hotel then? So it went from like a cheap hotel to a new came with that? It's, well, I don't know. It, after a while, it, it might become like a four or five star, but it tends to drop after a while. And then, because God's not real pleased with that kind of uh, situation, so that that hotel will eventually close. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's a good word because um, 
we know that if families are not healthy, because mm -hmm. you know, we're working with families, the concern is if the family's not healthy, they're going to produce what? Unhealthy kids. Right. It's going to become, hopefully not, but possibly become a menace to society. Right. So yeah, the unity in a family does Impact, yeah. impact the community, hopefully in a positive way. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, what do you, I mean, this is blended families, right? Mm -hmm. So, what happens when the family becomes unhealthy? People leave the church mm -hmm. most of the time, right? It's, it's a sin issue. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that down here with the communication thing. You know, when sin, it was like in the garden, when sin entered, now they were ashamed that they were naked. And the first thing they tried to do was hide and run away. And they didn't want to talk to anybody, especially God. <laughs> right? So that's what happens. When there's sin in the camp, people generally want to hide it. They don't want to talk about it. They, and as, in order to not talk about it, they don't talk. So, like, with a husband and a wife, whoever is doing the sin starts shutting up about everything, right? So that communication starts breaking down. And it's the same in the community, in the church. If the family breaks apart, there's somebody that's not going to go to the church. I mean, you might have one, but the other four or five may not. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's... I mean, we're, we're Christians here, and we, we should all have a good vertical relationship. You know, we should be spending time. It's like the pyramid. Vertical is number one. The relationship with God is our eternal relationship. We need to kind of have that perspective of we're going to be around forever. Not here, necessarily, but somewhere. And so... You have the perspective of, okay, I'm in, I am an eternal being. I'm going to spend eternity somewhere. Where would I rather go? Okay, I would rather go to heaven. It sounds so much better <laughs> than hell. Well, how do I get there? Well, we just talked about that. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone. That's it. That's our only option. It's not by what we do. It's not, but it's more by who we are. We're a child of God because we have accepted John 14, 6. Right? Faith is just the beginning of your vertical relationship. That's how you obtain it. Right? Anybody that's uh, built any kind of a business or even just had a job. You know, it's one thing to get the job. It's a whole different story to keep it or even get promoted in it, right? Faith is the beginning. That's where you accept John 14, 6. That Jesus is the way, not one of the ways. The way. So, okay, we have enough faith in us to accept that. So we begin a vertical relationship. Now what? Well, you have when you obtain something, it's like buying a new car. You gotta take care of it. Yes. You gotta do the maintenance. Or it just falls apart. It'll quit running after a while. Sarah. Um, I feel like um, the Lord is trying to tell me and just remind me that the marriage is the most important relationship on the planet. On the planet. <laughs> on the planet. So, you know, vertical versus horizontal relationships, and, and that's why it's under so much attack. And right. it's, it's not for the weak. <laughs> <laughs> not for the weak. No, you're exactly right. It was Marriage was the first thing that got started. That was the first... I mean, once he did all the animals and Adam named them all and everything, he said, okay, you need a wife. And it was a wife. It wasn't a girlfriend, right? It was a wife, okay? So, but we also, and we mentioned this yesterday, in the garden, 
there was a curse on Eve that she's going to want to be the one in charge. But she's going to have to obey the husband. Amen. And well, it says, he will rule over her. Now that word rule, when you really go back and look it up, it's like an evil king. So it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. It's no fun. Right? So that's the curse. Now there's conflict in marriage from day one, practically. It, yeah, it was perfect. But once sin, once sin came in, now because of the curse, because of the sin, now there's conflict in marriage. I just want to make two observations quickly on John fourteen six. I'm mm-hmm. the way. It all relates to the name of Jesus. Uh, we have to be aware of what that means when Jesus says, I am the way. He is the name at which all knees shall bow, and all tongues will confess that he's the Lord of Lord. So when that when you translate that verse into John 14, I am the way, now you have, because you know, anybody can come and say, I'm Larry Snap, unless you show up and be the Lord and say, no, I am Dr. Larry Snap. Right. And then the other thing I want to say is the faith on the vertical. Three years ago, when Dr. Larry and Carol Snap laid that foundation in my life, I was I was stumbling, you know, with my divorce and all that. The best advice that I got was to focus on my vertical relationship. Now it's con- it's counterintuitive because you want to focus on the things that doesn't work, and it's not the other. But they kept on coming on me, no, focus on your vertical relationship. What happened is, the problem didn't go away. My personal relationship started working. So when that starts working, all the problems around you, you're not anymore as you were before. You know, you feel weak, you feel like you have no ideas. The flow of the Holy Spirit will take care of that. So the vertical relationship... Thank you for that foundation. Yeah. And Wayne, you've mentioned it before. I mean, you've been married like 40 years, right? Yes. And as a blended family, and the thing that struck me the most was your comment about always putting on the armor. Yes. Right? Every day. Every day. And to this day. To this day. But it's like looking back. What really made an impact on me was the fact that there were a lot of things that didn't happen. That's the point that I make about putting on the full armor of God. It wasn't until just being associated with Drs. Larry and Carol that in looking back on our life, we started blended families when there was no path to follow. And But one of the things, and I can't remember the message in church that that I received, but to put on the full armor of God, that's Ephesians 6, 11 through 19, mm-hmm. and to do that daily. Well, I did that daily in my daily prayer 40 years ago, and then many, many of the issues that that are huge stumbling blocks for blended families did not happen to us. And we were also led to do things that that have become primary success points uh, in in blending of families that we did that we didn't have any reason other than the Holy Spirit importing into our life that we did it. And so looking back on our life and how good it was and how successful it was in blending our family, it was basically putting on the full armor of God daily as I do to this day. And uh, you don't know what success you have because things don't happen. <laughs> right. You can't identify that. But recognize that your, your, your life is going on blessed for a reason. Mm-hmm. Not because of things that we did, but with the, the protection available from putting on the full armor of God. Yeah, I, I really like the whole description you just made because what, what I'm seeing is the fact that you're you're being proactive in putting on the armor but then the lie is nothing's happening that's correct so then it's like well why do I need to put it on right, right. Mm-hmm. try taking it off for a day or two right. <laughs> pow <laughs> right excellent with your 
was talking about here describing the vertical relationship. He worked on that vertical relation, mm -hmm. vertical relationship, right. and part of that was learning how to put on that armor. And it impacted the horizontal relationship in his marriage. This is Christian Living Radio. And family. Yeah. Right, exactly. And that's, see, that, that was kind of the, the John 1, 3 through 10 part. First John 1 through 10. When you're being obedient, you are blessed. Amen. It's, it's when you're trying to do it all on your own. You know, the, the flesh gets in the way. The lies of the enemy get in the way. And one of the, the neatest things I, I remember hearing a long time ago was if you don't put your armor on and you go into battle, you're a guaranteed casualty. Yeah. It's not good. <laughs> and... You know, we're talking about faith, um, and I know there's a lot of understanding of that. I'm not bringing maybe anything new, but um, repentance is very important when it comes to faith. Mm -hmm. You cannot approach faith in the flesh. So many people want to see God, me included. Mm -hmm. But it's not that it's not possible. It's possible in a way that the flesh is not able to see it. So you have to learn to apply faith because faith to the spiritual is what the eyes and the ears are to the natural. Mm -hmm. now, I can talk about this the whole day and nobody would believe me until you experience it. Right. And it's funny with faith, it's, it's God has a, has, has a particular way of dialoguing with us. And it's funny how we jump in a car or drive a bicycle and we understand the dynamics. But when it comes to spiritual and flesh, it's like, whoa, why can I not just drive the car like a bicycle? Because it's not a bicycle. So there are certain dynamics, and repenting means that you change. You don't start reading the Bible with, okay, God, let me do it my No, you listen to what God says. You change your way of thinking, and that's when faith comes, and that's when you experience God, and that's when you see God. Yeah. My ways are higher than your ways. Thank you. Right? I know we're counseling couples all the time um, when they come to us, and they say, well, everything was going okay. For a while, now it's not, things are, are, are all going and they're just falling apart. And we say, okay, well, let's go back to the chart here. Uh, let's look at the priority pyramid. And um, when you're getting to putting the marriage second, and what are you doing to strengthen that marriage? Are you praying together daily? Are you going to church at least once a week? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? And nine times out of 10, we stop doing the prayer together. Wow. You let your guard down. Yeah. Sin knows that. And that's the first place it's going to attack you. Yeah, it's, you it, have to keep the prayers. You have to keep them. And then the last few comments are a really good transition to the next thing up here. Right? You've, you've obtained your salvation. You've obtained your vertical relationship. And now you have to maintain it. Which... You do through prayer and fasting, and you look in Matthew chapter 6 at, uh, uh, let's see here, uh, it says five, 5 and 6 is don't pray as the hypocrites do, which Jesus was referring to the Pharisees. They were all about the show. You know, being out on the street corner, oh God, you know, and it was, their heart was nowhere near to the right place. They just wanted to look good. Right, so their prayers weren't being answered. They were probably not even being heard. Um, Seven through fifteen is the Lord's prayer, and it, it's the example of how we should pray. Right, all the disciples were like, "Oh Lord, show us, teach us how to pray," and that's what He did. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Right. And then he goes on about you know forgiveness and and those kind of things and lead us not into temptation of the evil one and and those kind of things. But then we get to verse sixteen. It says, "When you fast, don't look like it, <laughs> and don't tell." Them. Oh yeah, well don't you know you're not going around. Oh, I'm fasting. You know you just kind of do your normal stuff. You clean yourself up and you look good and. That's between you and God, right? You're not doing it for show, um, but it's it's expected. It's part. Of, it says when, you know. And it was just understood back in those days when Jesus was, you know, walking around and and during his years on the on the earth that that's just how you did it. 
you prayed, you fasted. That was just part of that vertical relationship. So that's part of maintaining it. Now, we are sinners. We are saved by grace, right? So occasionally, something goes south and our vertical gets broken. Okay, we've, we've obtained it, we've been maintaining it for a while, and then we have a big oops, and now we're in deep doo-doo. So now what? To me, Psalm 51 is one of the best examples of how to restore a broken vertical relationship. It's King David wrote the psalm, and it was shortly after he had the big mess with Bathsheba. Okay, he he did all kind of bad stuff trying to well he he sinned, that was bad, but then he tried to cover it up and committed murder and all kind of stuff. Uh ended up having a child which died after childbirth and you know God just wasn't going to bless all that. Right. But because David had a heart for God, he understood where he messed up. So if you look at Psalm 51, there's a whole bunch of things in there that David did to restore his vertical. One of the biggest ones was, hey, Lord, I screwed up. He humbled himself. He got down on his, on his face and cried out to the Lord, you know, hey, man, I, I am such a, a wretch. I'm so sorry. You know, very humble and repenting. I'm glad you mentioned that word because that was a big part of this. He was very humble, knew he had to confess the sin and then repent and just throw himself on the mercy of God. But he was faithful enough and, and knew had that vertical enough that he knew God would restore him. It's it's not like, oh, I really messed up. Uh, I don't... You, you probably don't want to have me back in the in the house, Lord. No. God wants you in the house. He's not going to keep you out in the garden. He's going to bring you in, clean you up, and uh, all that. So, and I'll use Karen's example from a couple of years ago. Say, um, you know, they took ownership. You know, and right. Something that we hear a lot of that we don't. You know, back in the garden lane, well, you know, everybody else, but he took ownership, took responsibility for his action. Right, exactly. And he threw himself on the mercy seat of God through repentance and humility. Yeah. And then trusted God to And he, he knew God would cleanse him of his unrighteousness and restore him a clean heart. Because he had a good vertical relationship. Yeah. He understood yeah. God's willingness that God would be willing to forgive him, but he had to do his part. Right. And the the which is part of the blended or beyond divorce class, the uh, second chapter is all about taking responsibility for your part. Right? And that's what David did. Okay. This is just another example of a vertical relationship, right? It's up and down. <laughs> right now, what happens? You know, prayers are going up and down, and they're getting answered, and everything is cool. And then there's a sin. Right. Now, you know, we're this is God, okay? This is us. Now we're praying, but it only goes that far. It's like it hits the ceiling, and then it doesn't go anywhere else. Right. And God's like. Are you talking to me? Yep. I know. I wish you would say that. I, I see your lips moving, but I can't hear you. So, like, like Tibor said, you know, so there has to be repentance. Amen. Right? And part of the, this is like the process, Psalm 51, is the process that we have to do to get right with God. Yes. Right? We have to confess confess the sin we have to repent we have to accept our 
Yeah, that's, that's confessing, right? You, I own it. I'm confessing it, right? That's, that's why I did it, okay? Now we have to change the way we think, which is what repent means. It's, it's not like you do anything different, but you're changing how you think, okay? So we've confessed it. We've changed our thinking on that particular thing that we were doing, now we have to ask God to forgive us. For whatever the sin was, now there needs to be forgiveness. God is faithful to forgive our sins. Yes. Very quickly. And now we have to forgive ourselves. which is a lot of times the hard part, right? Because there's something about the fact that you know what you did. In some cases, it was really horrible. So you feel like, well, I know God forgives, but it was such a horrible thing I did. I don't know if I can forgive me, right? I think the forgiveness of self relates very closely to the change that you have. When you purpose to change, you have to do significant things. Write it down or whatever you do personally to make sure that change is not just a a random thought, that there is a permanent issue that you do. Write yourself notes, whatever it is, but that ties closely then uh, into the forgiving of self. Right. And just for me personally, you know, I had a major failure. Right. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that could stick with me for a long time. But I didn't want it to. You know, I, I wanted to get rid of that real quick. So when I understood that for those that are in Christ, they are a new creation. And there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Yes. I'm like, sign me up. Yes. And fortunately for me, I was very quick to forgive myself. <laughs> I, I, I understood God's grace. I understood His mercy. I understood what a new creation meant. And that's, I wanted that. You know, uh, so many people struggle with the whole new creation thing. You know, it's like, well, for whatever, you know, in the TV and movies, you know, whenever there's like a, an AA group or whatever that 12-step thing is, it's always, hi, my name is, and I am. Well, yeah, I mean, you, but it's, they should be saying, and I used to be. I was. Or I was, right? If they're a Christian. Okay. Now, obviously, there's a lot of non-Christians in those groups, and they they talk about a higher power, and it's whatever you want it to be, right? Use the force. But yeah, um, they they got to get you from the dark side to the to the light, okay? Which is kind of yeah, right. It depends on what color it is, I think. And a lot of times, people will be quick to remind you. Of what um, you did, and and one of our things we like to say both in the Beyond the Boys class and this class, don't judge me by my past. I don't live there anymore. Right. It's like Larry said, I am a new creation. I have accepted what I've done. I've confessed it. I've repented, and I've forgiven me, and God's forgiven me. So that's just how it is. Don't judge me by my past. I don't live there. And just like you said, one of the difficult things, because life is spiritual warfare for a Christian, the enemy is going to use things from your past to try to destroy you. Yes. So you have to know in your knower that I that there is no condemnation Amen. for me. Now, it may get difficult here on earth, but in heaven, I'm good. It goes back to that saying you used to say, the devil knows you by your... Sin? Well, he knows your name, but calls you by your sin. Mm -hmm. God knows your sin, but calls you by your name. Mm -hmm. 
in dealing with with Satan in that battle, you can also then refer back to the amount of change that you made. I confess this. I made these changes. I am that new creation. Here's the evidence. Right. And therefore, I stand on it. Yeah. And I understood that I had to become different. You know, it wasn't just poof. Okay, I'm a Christian. I'm different. Right. I had I would men's ministry, Bible studies for years. Amen. You know, my goal was to become a different person that was noticeable. Right? That's the thing. It's it's got to be noticeable. It's it's not by our good works, but it's for good works. People have to see there's a difference. And there we, um, I prompted Psalm 51. Karen said something really special. She said a lot of things, but this was yeah, really special. That's true. Um, David knew the Lord. Yeah, he did. Okay, this is the guy that fought a leopard and a bear and killed him with his bare hands. This is the guy that knocked off Goliath with his slingshot. Do you think he knew God? I think he had a pretty good idea of his God. So many of us try to get to God, including myself, by memorizing, by having a mental ascent. And he put it really well. Have an experience. Experience God in your life. And when you go through those things, like I do, like everybody does, I recant and say, Lord, you help me in this situation. Help me in that situation. See, the thing is, the grace and mercy that he has for me, it makes me cry every morning because I am so unfit for his love. But he loves me the way I am. And what I love about God is that he loves me enough not to leave me where I am. That's good. He, God doesn't leave you where you are. He has a future and a hope. He doesn't just save you and then leave you there. He has a reason for you to be here. And it's for way more than where you're at. But it takes him some time to, to get you there. And we have, like Karen said, we have to take some of that responsibility on in our own efforts to get to some place. We, we don't just sit there and, okay, God, whenever you're ready... You know, go poof, and then uh, I'll, I'll go. Right? We we have to study. We have to pray. We have to spend time working on the vertical. We got to get our armor on. Yes. You know, and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, forgiveness comes in truth. You know, because the Lord is truth. Yeah. And so if we stay in denial, we're sinning. Yeah. And we're not going to get to where we need to be. Yeah. Never get his forgiveness. Well, you, the, the other thing that we're showing that in the scripture, I think it's in the Ephesians, it says that God is rich in mercy. Yeah. And when I saw that, I, said, I thought about the wealthiest man in the world. And I was, that God is rich in mercy. And what is mercy? Because you talk about grace, but what is mercy? Well, grace is getting something you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. As in, like, punishment for sin, right? Grace is salvation. Mercy is not being killed <laughs> because you're a sinner, okay? Now, and the... Uh, uh, some of you just said, Karen, it was like, that's the, the act of confessing is the truth. That is... Recognizing the truth, okay? Your word says what I did is a sin. So I'm confessing that as a sin because that's what your word says, right? It, it gets back to knowing the truth that, you know, the truth sets you free, right? So when you confess a sin, it sets you free because you're in the truth now. So that's good. And, and when you go through the process, then, you know, that opens up I always like Karen's, you know, the artery, you know, 
the blood flow starts going again. Amen. Right? <laughs> when it gets really, really blocked, you get a heart attack. Right? Whoa. So you don't want to leave it blocked for very long. But uh, the process opens that up again. Yes. When you go through it, you've confessed, you've changed your mind about what happened, you've allowed God to forgive you, you've asked for forgiveness and received it, but you've also forgiven yourself, yes. which is like the last, you know, it puts the period at the end of the sentence, right? So that's the process. Look at Psalm 51. That's, you know, when I get, and it's, I should have said when broken because sooner or later it'll get broken and we'll need to restore it. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, Wayne. See you later. Um, so I, I put if, but it should be when. Use Psalm 51 to restore it. Okay. Uh, just to kind of wrap it up a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about the horizontal, which, you know, everything we've done so far is vertical, and that's all about our relationship with God. And it makes sense we spend most of the time on that, right? Because <laughs> without that, we got nothing. The horizontal is a human relationship, so it's for the purposes of the class mostly. It's We're talking the husband and the wife. Um, Sarah mentioned it. Prayer, or Carol did one of Somebody at this end of the table. <laughs> Pray together daily. That was one of the first things our counselors taught us. That is the glue. It creates intimacy with the one you're praying to which is God, the one you're praying with, which is your spouse, if you have one, and the ones you're praying for, which, you know, children, family. co-workers, in-laws, outlaws, you know, whoever. Um, date night, okay? This is a thing that reinforces the pyramid because we want to have number one right, we want to have our vertical right, we want to have our horizontal right, which is our, our spouse, the, the marriage. But date night, if there's kids involved, it reinforces the fact that the marriage is important. Amen. And if, if you have to get a babysitter, I mean, you know, it, expense is one thing. A lot of people don't have the extra for babysitters and all that kind of stuff, but do something where you get away from the kids, even for an hour or two, at least once a week, just so it shows them how important you guys are to each other. They see that. They understand, oh, mom and dad are on a date. Ew, gross. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, mess with their heads. Go out on a date. <laughs> Show them what it's like to be married and have fun. Right? Uh, Ephesians 4, no evil speaking. Don't be tearing each other up. Speak life. That was one thing for us. We really didn't like each other there for a little bit. And part of our prayer, our daily prayer together was just thanking each other for loving each other. And, you know, she wanted to spit in my face. You broke the trust. But, yeah, I mean, we had... And then I was like, you know, thank you, Lord, for this precious gift you've given me. And I'm like, well, that's a stretch, you know. But we were speaking life into something. You know, we were trying to resurrect something that had died. So, you know, you can say fake it till you make it. But you're speaking life. It's like, Lazarus, come out. You know, you speak what you want. That's right. Speak, choose life, right? Uh, so no evil speaking. And we talked about this a little bit already. Sin blocks communication. I can attest to that personally. That was, you know, when I was doing what I was doing, I sure didn't want to talk about it. But God had other ideas. Mm -hmm. And we can see it in a lot of the things going on in our government. Things that were hidden are becoming exposed. That's the way God works. Sin will be exposed 
if it is not confessed. Yes. And in his time. Well, out. right. So. It's coming out every time. Yeah. Yeah, it's all in his timing, you know. So sin blocks communication. People that are sinning, especially against a spouse, are not going to want to talk about it. And generally, they're just not going to want to talk. Right. So they shut up. They so they become distant, right? So somebody's got to know. Christian living, Christian living. Christian Living Radio It's a lifestyle Christian Living Christian Living Christian Living Radio Christian Living Radio Spreading the good news of Jesus Christ 24-7 Our goal is to bring you a life-changing word Through music and diverse programming Like the one you're listening to now Pastor Kenyatta Goins is the visionary of Christian Living Radio, and he's dedicated to the idea that Christians should even have a more prominent presence in the marketplaces. Maybe you need prayer for yourself and or your family. Maybe for a friend. We'd be privileged to stand in the gap for you. If you're listening to this broadcast, click on the Contact Us tab and send us your prayer request. We'd also like to hear from you if you have something on your mind or just give us some feedback. We support many ministries, so maybe you'd like to make a one-time or a monthly recurring donation. We believe that when you sow into these ministries, you'll indeed be blessed. And of course, if you sow into this show in particular, we believe that it's a blessing for you, so please consider sponsoring us. There's a special area under the Donate tab where you can send your monetary gift or call 520-812-6363. That's 520-812-6363 to receive more information about sponsorship. Thank you. A voicemail from a real Banner Health patient. Kudos to all the staff that treated me that day. They were as quick as possible, as thorough as possible, and they gave me peace of mind. We're here to help you breathe easier. Banner Health. Exhale. If you need a job right now, then listen up. Integrity Staffing is now hiring for warehouse positions at Amazon Fulfillment in Phoenix. Earn top pay rates and find a job you'll love with a shift that fits your life. Tap now or visit phoenixlistener.com to apply today.